So today I really wanted to get going with some basic instructions for the raw edge quilting. When I did the five basting strategies in the free motion video, I felt it would be remiss not to cover pins. But for raw edge quilting, I don't recommend them. When I quilt, it's almost like in my mind's eye, I see where I'm supposed to go next. I see that I'm supposed to curve around this way. I see that there's a little branch of leaves over here. And then I start to quilt them. And I know for myself, if I stop to pull a pin, I would lose that. You want to keep things loose and fluid. You want to just keep moving. You don't want to stop and regroup any more than you need to to take care of all the other things you need to take care of when you're raw edge quilting. Another thing is that you really can't do this unless you have some facility and ease with free motion quilting. And so if you're not confident doing a stipple already, I would like you to go back and work on that. And here are some ways you can work on it at any level that doesn't require a machine. If you just do anything your pencil can do and see how you can get back out of there, how you can cover the ground, what shapes you do and don't like. Many of the things you can do with your pencil, you can do with your machine. And your quilting will look very much like your drawing once you get really fast at quilting. These shapes that are sort of like peacock shapes, if we start on the outside of our area and we just come in and I usually do three loops and the last one has a point and I'm still headed the same direction I started on the first loop and you can just do that for a while and then when you want to if I do this I'm gonna be heading off my paper and I want to head in so you swing wide and you come back in and then you can keep going the same direction and then I'm gonna do one more here and then I would like to start heading back this direction and so I swing wide and it's hard to remember that quilting something for the first time. But another way that you can uh, work on your free motion skills that I recommend is to make pot holders. And when I say make pot holders, because you're gonna react to the prints you're using. And they're gonna cause you to decide to do things a certain way. And so when I quilt pot holders out of this, I tend to start mimicking uh, these leaf shapes. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of mimic that. And so I'm going to go like this, and I'm going to quilt like this, and then I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And I'm not going to drive myself crazy trying to make it perfect because I've learned that it looks pretty good even if it's kind of imperfect. And I'm going to quilt that. So then I'm going to come and I'm going to take as my inspiration this little shape here. And I'm just doing this as fast as I can when I'm making pot holders. Um, I'm gonna do this, put like this. Oh, this would look better with a little bit of veining and I'll come back and do a little bit of this. And then there's that one. And when I'm done, my pot holder, might look something like this. And so this is the reason that making pot holders has really informed my quilting. Because I'm looking at the, these shapes when I'm doing it. And I'm looking at these and these. And I'm looking at uh, these fish. And I've been a lifelong fan of paisley. And look at these nice shapes. Okay, so we need to set up our machine. And whatever you do for your free motioning, go ahead and do that. You know, I've used a size 14 needle for this almost the whole time. I'm gonna suggest that you just use as many colors of construction thread as you have. This is all cotton covered polyester, 40 weight thread that is a basic sewing thread such as you would make a blouse out of or a pair of pants. If you're unsure of your stitch quality right now, you can hide behind uh, threads that blend with your fabric. 
And you can do that when you're starting out. And I did that when I first started free motion quilting. I almost always matched my thread to my background. And I, I matched my top thread to my bobbin thread. At the point where I was doing a contrasting color, my top and bottom thread matched. At this point, I stitch with a top thread that contrasts my fabric as much as possible. And I almost always stitch in back with some version of taupe, khaki, camel. Now I didn't baste, so I like to get this nice and flat and kind of pay attention. Because if you quilt a whole bunch with this like this, you get pretty frustrated with yourself. <laughs> Okay, so with this piece, one of the first things I want to do is do some broad shapes that are intended to uh, really start quilting this down and cover some ground. And so in order to do that, um, I'm going to pick something that is contrasting, especially in value to my thread not only in color but in value. I want you to be able to see. And then I'm going to find the spot that that happened. There's that one and there's a little one there where I skipped one stitch. And I'm going to mark those so that I do something about that. Your ends need to have not very big gaps because if this were a huge if this were a huge gap here then I would need to stitch inside of it because you really want to come close to, you don't want to have big areas of your design that aren't attached on the edges. And so, um, not only do you need to do that, but I like the way these things look if they have another row of stitching often. And so I'm going to go down this side and I don't know if I'll go down that again. We'll see what happens. The principles of design that always apply, apply here as well. Uh, sometimes with a slightly different take. I'm talking about balance, emphasis, movement, pattern, repetition, proportion, rhythm, variety, unity, contrast, value. Whimsy is one of my favorite ones. I, I love to juxtapose things so that they're whimsical. Something you totally wouldn't expect with some little tumbling chicks. But some of my favorite things to do. Do a serious landscape, but one of the foreground fabrics is little chicks all different direction. Sometimes I do a piece where I really want it to be very formal, but I still always want there to be an element of surprise, something that's unusual. Through all of this though, the main thing is to trust yourself and your reaction to what you're seeing and what you're creating. And you know, it's okay sometimes to show things to people and see how they react, but first really try to get in touch with how you feel about it. And then I'm going to move on to this one. And I have a ton of stuff picked out for this. I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. Now this piece is the one that I cut my background larger so that you can see what it's like if you do that instead of basting. I would still baste this when I got started. But this will give you something to pull through with and keep you away from your needle. And this trivet could be completely perfectly square when you're done, but I do mine always with an irregular shape. Okay, I'm gonna maybe, I kind of like that. Often with the first layer of this, what I do is take something, a big scrap like this. Okay, so there are also some general do's and don'ts that I want to uh, cover. See how thick this is and how much it wants to move around in an unpleasant fashion? That's why I didn't think people would really want to start with this. But I wanted to show you it so that you'd see that it's possible. One is don't use tiny scraps and put your hands right up to the needle. Use a larger scrap and your thread tails to pull your piece around from a safe distance. Tight stitches near the edge of your shapes work the best, but you can get as elaborate as you have patience for. When you stitch off the edge like I just did, it can be a little bit traumatic to uh, just the stitch formation that's going on. So I actually try to avoid doing that as much as possible. I could have cut this down and then it would allow me to see better. The best thing to do is to, to feel for it. 
I would like you to be a little obsessive about checking tension on the back side of your piece. Um, don't only micro focus on your piece. Uh, something can look really great to you very close up and then and then if you see it at a distance it's a little bit milk toast to you. Uh, prop your piece up against your machine and, and go, go get a cup of tea and come back and look at it from a distance or if you're not working pin it on your wall your design wall if you have one or even just a place where you're not you don't mind putting a pin or two in the wall um, and leave it there so that when you walk by or when you're sitting in your chair uh, you can see how you like it from a distance especially as your pieces get bigger remind yourself not to clench into your work and if you have been loosen up you're supposed to enjoy this process and not just let your body get really hunched in and unbalanced um, because of the way that you've been sewing. Uh, try to be mindful of those things and hydrate. You know, this is hard work. You're actually leveling up here with your tight free motion quilting. And so this is work. Even if you enjoy it, even if you're like me and you're having the time of your life, it's work and you need water. Um, as you go, Take a piece of chalk, uh, I often use play chalk and white chalk, and really mark areas where you've done something you don't like so that you remember to fix them before you're done. There are lots of ways to fix things and, and we'll talk about that as we go. This is the one I'm actually the most worried about because I've got this uh, very neutral background and I want to make this into some kind of a flower and I'm not positive that I have a good plan. <laughs> a few other things to talk about quickly. Um, other aids you might want for this and a lot of them are talked about in the earlier video which I'll throw up on the screen here. Go back and watch that if you need a refresher on some of this stuff. But anyway, uh, you might want to wear gloves. I don't care for them anymore. I wore them all the time in the beginning and went through a lot of different kinds, including a lot of $2 gardening gloves from the local hardware store. Um, you're going to want marking tools to mark a little bit, especially mistakes or if you're adding a highlight somewhere and you want it to be a heart, I will often draw those hearts with a washable marker because we're gonna wash everything later. You know, you can use anything that will wash out, but be careful. Uh, there are lots of markers that are washable until you heat them up with your iron and then they're permanent and you don't wanna use something like that. Spray starch. Uh, I've only done this once or twice because I use high quality quilting cotton, but if I were using some really fussy, uh, gauzy apparel type fabrics and trying to work that into my designs, I would probably spray those with starch and hit them with my iron and then get those fabrics to behave more like paper, which is one of the things Rosemary discusses in her book. Um, you can also use glue stick. I, I don't use it much for this and, and I never really did. But I used glue stick quite a bit when I first started doing uh, landscapes. And I found that if I glued up a big landscape and started working on it, everything pulled off and was falling all over the place by the time I got very far. And so if you're gonna glue, you might like glue a few things that you're gonna do the next morning and then, and then do those once it's dry. Um, but because we layer as we go and we work over the top of stuff, it's sort of hard to do that with this. It's better, I think, to just get good at controlling your fabric. So again, I'm not going to be using a lot of this stuff, but I did in the beginning. Okay, we're going to trim as we go, and we want to trim between an eighth and up to three sixteenths. An eighth is kind of better. We don't want to go below that. Things will start to rip out. We're going to have to stitch those. Uh, an extra time or two really close to the cut edge if we've accidentally cut that close or some other way 
fix that so that it's not going to just be all falling apart after the first wash. It'll be ratty and we'll trim that up and clean it up, but we don't want it to be actually falling apart. If you don't have a pair of these uh, curved tip embroidery scissors that I use, and I, I couldn't do this without them. They're so, uh, they respond so well to small mo movements and allow you to really, really get in and cut things, clip things close and all of that. I, I wouldn't even try to do this without these. You could probably get used to doing it with your big dressmaking shears, but I, I personally, I would accidentally cut things I didn't mean to constantly that way. You do have to be careful with these. It is easy to poke a hole and get going on a hole, and it is easy to, um, to do other kinds of mistakes, but once you're used to these, uh, they will really help you get the results you want. Don't stitch long straight lines that follow the grain of your fabric because again we're if you have a straight line you want it to sort of follow the bias of your fabric so that once you trim it it doesn't just keep losing threads off the edge and fraying off the edge and fraying off the edge until it basically passes your stitching line and it's no longer attached to your piece. Okay, so last night I made some little plans on how to go forward with my three little pieces. And so we'll just see uh, if I follow through with this or if I go um, other directions. Now I'm going to begin filling in my mid-ground. I want to enhance my design. I favor organic shapes. Sometimes I do graphic ones for fun. Sometimes I like to mix it up. I spoke to my daughter and on this one I'm actually going to add some kanji characters for water and fire towards the end uh, with the next step. But for now I'm adding three leaves. I've decided to do them in uh, different fabrics. I'm stitching with yellow thread here for emphasis. I recommend that you switch thread a lot so that you have interest close up, in, uh, something for the eye to look at and all that variation. During this process you'll be finding your own motifs and you'll find that you do the same shapes over and over and that with time they get more sophisticated and later we will go through more layers of fabric but for right now just stick to the background layer then the mid-ground layer and then your accent layer on the top because it's hard to minimize puckering until you sort of get used to doing it and then you get to where you can go through a lot of layers and create some really interesting effects. So I do recommend that you trim away enough so that you minimize overlap in the center or other overlapping parts of your design. Often when I find that my line is a little too straight and a little too straight on the grain, I will just cut the line a little wiggly and that helps compensate a lot for that. Especially if, you know, after it's washed, if I like the look of that. You could resort to satin stitching certain elements down. I, I don't do that. And you'll just get used to this idea of working with a loose piece of fabric and drawing with your needle. You're really only limited by your imagination. There has been a method to my madness here, and I think you'll see here what I'm talking about and why I recommend that you do watch the earlier tutorials, even if you're not going to make them. I really have been trying to build skills with everyone so that they're ready to take these things on. If you're an advanced free motion quilter, I think you can skip a lot of this. But if it's sort of new to you, or if you've never been very satisfied with the whole process, I recommend that you watch some of those earlier videos, because we're trying to build an attitude about our sewing as well as technique. I like to stitch flowers a lot on the things I make, and there are several sort of habitual flowers that I do. This is one of them. When I did my sketch, I decided to add a little bit more of this gray area. And so that's what I'm doing here. I discover in a few minutes that I am 
not stitching the same way that I did earlier, but I decided that it's going to still look nice, and so I'm just going to trim it out and keep it this way. The main thing with this is to just have fun and play and uh, not drive yourself crazy feeling like there's some way it's supposed to be. There aren't any mistakes if, it, if you like it and if it's well made, if it's beautiful. This fabric is one that I've used for years. I've only got about half a yard of it left, but it's one of my very favorite fabrics. I feel like it sings on everything I ever put it on. One of the things that I've noticed when I do this is that uh, sinuous lines seem to be better than sharp zigzagging shapes, which tend to cause pile-ups, especially with a fast machine like mine. And if you're hesitant about free motioning, again, please don't go through too many layers. Try to keep it to your, your sandwich and then three layers on top of it. Later we're going to be looking at how we can fix the mistakes that we've been marking along the way, as well as embellishments that will just add that little certain something that we like. Um, we want certain things to pop, we want certain things to sparkle, we just want everything to be visually interesting and create whatever feeling we're going for with our work. So don't forget about buttons and beads and ribbons and lace and embroidery and any other embellishing tactic that you love and can add later. These are only limited by your imagination. I'm not going to show that much of the stitching on my little round uh, flower table mat that I'm making because this really isn't something that I think anyone else will be able to jump right in on. And if you were able to, I think you could probably do this without any instruction from me. Um, the video is going to be pretty long as it is, and so I'm just going to show you this at stages. If you decided to do a mat for your table with one layer of batting, whether it's round or square, just do whatever you would like to, uh, whether it's a floral uh, setup like the Tea Cozy with one or three or five flowers, or whether it's just some different shapes covering your mat, round or square. And uh, in the last video, we'll talk about different ways to finish that up, including the binding that we've already done in a couple of the previous videos. This flower is very similar to a bigger five petal flower that I've made a lot. And I know that this will look nice under my vase on my table. What I don't know is if it will look like any kind of a flower. Now I'm gonna add elements to the foreground, color highlights, refine my composition a little bit, as well as make some repairs. I could have had my leaves go over my two little areas of skip stitches earlier, but I didn't. Instead, I'm going to add some little uh, circles, which I like to do. And these will bring in the teal that is sort of in the inside lining of this tea cozy. And I think I'm going to do my stipple at the end with a teal colored thread as well to kind of bring that color in close up. On the trivet, I'm going to add a number of large teal circles and a few small ones scattered around. I'm not sure how much I like this one so far. It doesn't seem bright enough to me because my reddish uh, background is so subdued and so I may have to introduce another bright color at some point but for now I'm just going to add all this teal and see how I like that. I generally don't do a lot of embellishing that adds additional depth such as beading and stuff to the trivets but uh, you definitely could do that you could add trims and things you could do paint there are a lot of things you can do to add as well as to cover up mistakes I really didn't have anything on this one that bothered me very much and so I didn't mark anything I like to flip my piece over and clean my back up as I go. The more threads you have back there that are getting ratty and sewn down, the more time it takes later on. It's easier, in my opinion, to just take a minute now and then and just really clean up your back and your other areas. You can also catch on a thread when you're quilting and, 
and quilt it in pretty good to where you have to pick it out. And I just like to clean it up as I go. I do like it. I just wish it were a little brighter. Now I'm going to do something on the center of this flower. I, again, I'm unsure whether I'm going to like this as a flower, but for now I think I'll put a center in it that will be an accent. I think that I may need to add a little bit of green when I do my uh, binding as well as do a little shaping so that it suggests petals the way that a poppy does before I like this. I, I, I really don't know where I'm going to go with this, and but I have an idea that I'm going to add some satin stitching uh, the way that I like to do so that it kind of looks like flower parts coming off of the center and I'll probably do that with red variegated thread. And uh, I don't know how many things I have that I want to fix on this one. I haven't marked anything. There's nothing that I've really thought was a huge issue. And so I may have very little to actually repair as I go. I do have a few startup circles in my dark, dark green quilting that I think are kind of clunky looking. And so I'll probably try to go over those a little bit when I do my satin stitching. Very quickly, I'm gonna show you how I do the final quilting and add a few little stitched elements so that I make things pop a little and look the way I like and add the dimension that I like. During this phase I'm usually imagining beading that I might do later or other kinds of things I might want to bring in. But after I do this, the next thing I'm going to do is wash it and dry it very well in the dryer. And then I'm going to clean it up using a lint roller and my little scissors to trim off all the ratty parts and just get it looking nice. So in the next video, we'll take a look at those pieces and make them into whatever they're going to be ultimately and add any last little bells and whistles that we want to to our design.